civil society is an extraordinarily diverse group um, because really its only defining criteria is that it doesn't include governments or the private sector. In fact, it's so broad that in the IGF we've taken to carving out the internet technical community uh, from the civil society and private sector into its own stakeholder group. But what we're left with in civil society is a group that includes academics, um, activists and ordinary consumers amongst others. Yet despite this diversity, it is possible to generalise in saying that of all the stakeholder groups, civil society is the least likely to consider that the IGF has fulfilled its mandate from the Tunis Agenda. I'm going to propose uh, to spend a few minutes discussing why this is. Part of the reason is that it was largely civil society that developed the idea for an internet governance forum within the working group on internet governance. In fact, much of the IGF's mandate in the Tunis Agenda comes straight out of the working group's report including the paragraph about identifying emerging issues, bringing them to the attention of the appropriate bodies and making recommendations. So the Internet Governance Caucus, in fact, which has co-organised this workshop, was one of the strong supporters of the working group's pr proposal and it, it published a response in which it suggested that the IGF would be empowered to develop soft law instruments, such as recommendations, guidelines and declarations. So when the World Summit on the Information Society accepted the working group's recommendations over the objections initially of the private sector and the internet technical community, and not to mention the US government, civil society naturally believed that it had scored a surprising win. You know, granted that it was the product of a political compromise with um, the US government over um, oversight of ICANN, even so, what we believed we had achieved was the establishment of a soft policy-making forum in which civil society could participate on an equal footing to government and business. So three years later, with the IGF more than halfway through its initial term, what we appear to have ended up with is not a policy development forum of any kind, soft or hard, but simply an annual conference. I it's natural then that some members of civil society feel that a, a bait and switch has been pulled, because this is not what we bargained for. It certainly doesn't place civil society on an equal footing to the powerful governments and business interests who currently dominate internet governance, the internet governance regime and who are therefore quite adamant that the IGF should not disturb the status quo. Bob Pepper gave the example of um, the Global Network Initiative as a concrete outcome that shows the multi-stakeholder process works and has, has produced um, uh, some concrete tangible results in which all the stakeholders are involved. But in fact, the GNI isn't a good example of multi-stakeholderism because it's not multi-stakeholder. I'm not complaining that it doesn't include civil society, because it does, but it doesn't include government. Now, why should I be concerned about that as a civil society person? simply because governments will not buy into its output. We need to have fully multi-stakeholder um, decision-making in which all parties are involved in order to um, create lasting and productive outcomes from internet governance. So there is good reason to think that civil society has got its work cut out for it in trying to make any meaningful changes to the internet governance forum. Uh, in one sense, it's easy to blame the Secretariat and the multi-stakeholder advisory groups for developing structures and processes for the IGF that are ill-suited to the fulfilment of its mandate as a policy development body. But of course, the Secretariat and the MAG are themselves products of a, a larger political and economic system that will naturally resist any redistribution of power over internet governance. So what are civil society activists to do? We could concentrate on cha changing the larger political and economic system as in part the American people began to do on the 4th of November and as civil society has been doing on many other fronts uh, for years such as advocating for reforms within uh, WIPO and the WTO. But it seems to me that a more direct approach would be to develop proposals for reform to the IGF that will increase civil society's voice in policy making but without unduly challenging the existing authority of governments and the private sector. So how would we do this? Well, I've explained one approach in a paper that I wrote for this year's IGF uh, meeting that's been distributed by the Internet Governance Project uh, and which was in turn very loosely and partially based on the conclusions of my doctoral thesis. Without going into too much detail about it, I'll, I'll endeavour to describe the basic proposal in just four simple points. First, the MAG needs to be made more representative and accountable by being appointed by the stakeholders themselves, perhaps through a randomly, nominated, uh, a randomly appointed nominating committee, as in the case of the ITF. The Secretariat, in turn, should be accountable to the MAG. Second, the IGF's plenary sessions need to allow for intensive multi-stakeholder deliberation on policy proposals that are normally developed by the grassroots dynamic coalitions and workshops. For this to work, the participants must be supplied with balanced briefing material, be divided up into small but diverse groups, 
and be assisted by facilitators to discuss the proposals in depth, with each participant treating the others as equals. Third, the output of these small group discussions should be brought back to the plenary forum for further discussion, at the conclusion of which the MAG will be in a position to document any consensus that may have emerged and, if appropriate, to begin to formalise it as a recommendation of the IGF. Finally, a recommendation may only be issued with the approval of each of the stakeholder groups represented within the MAG. This is key in order to diffuse the concerns of governments and business that the IGF will challenge their own authority. At the same time, it also increases the relative authority of civil society by giving it the same right of veto over the recommendations as the other groups. So to wrap up, some of us in civil society have been feeling for a while that particularly the plenary sessions of the IGF are a bit of a waste of time. And this November, the ITU Secretary General said exactly that. Uh, leaving aside how disingenuous that may or may not be, it, it does show that the IGF's success is being questioned by others with more clout than civil society has. And that will bear on the outcome of the review that's being conducted before its five-year mandate ends. Now, we don't want the IGF to end, even in the state that it is now. It's, it's very valuable as it is. So my opinion is that the IGF's best hope for salvation is to go back and look afresh at the reasons for which its establishment was proposed by the Working Group on Internet Governance in the first place. If it can recapture that original vision, then in my view the IGF should have a long and fruitful future ahead of it. 